Welcome to GitLab's course on remote leadership. I'm Sid C. Brandy, co-founder and CEO at GitLab. The story of GitLab begins with my co-founder, Dimitri, who created GitLab from his home in the Ukraine as a tool to collaborate with his team at work. I discovered GitLab when I was living in the Netherlands, and I saw the potential it had. Later, Dimitri and I teamed up to build a company behind the open source project. What started as a collaboration platform for developers began to grow in what it is now, a complete DevOps platform delivered as a single application. In 2015, we joined Y Combinator's Winter's Batch in San Francisco. And at first, we attempted to have an office space there. However, we found that people stopped showing up at work, but the work was still getting done we eventually realized that there was no need for an office space and we became an all remote company. Since then, GitLab has grown in size. As of the summer of 2020, we are 1,300 team members in 68 countries and regions around the world. And we're openly documented our learnings as an all remote organization. Today, we're happy to launch this course to help other leaders who are considering adopting remote work. In the weeks ahead, you'll hear from many leaders across GitLab on the differences in running a distributed company as opposed to one with shared offices. Whatever your team looks like today, our goal is to help you grow and build a successful distributed organization. I hope you enjoy the course. Hi, I'm Josh Ehrman, the learning and development partner here at GitLab. Here's what you can expect from taking this course. As a prerequisite, you should have some managerial leadership or people management experience. You do not need to have worked remotely before. And even if you have, we believe you'll gain a lot of new knowledge from taking this course. In module one, we'll cover the essentials of what it means to work remotely and why it's a major trend across continents and industries. In module two, we'll dive deep into people management practices to build a high functioning distributed team. In module three, we'll explore the differences in, in management that come with a remote work environment. And in module four, we'll discuss how to create a strong company culture to improve retention, satisfaction, and performance. Now, whether you're working to help your organization embrace remote work, or building a remote company from scratch, or even looking to strengthen your own knowledge, you'll walk away from this course with a plan. Each module, we will guide you through important action steps to creating your own remote work plan. By the end of the first module, you'll be ready to hit the ground running. From the entire GitLab team, we're so honored and thrilled that you are joining us here today in your remote work journey. Thank you and enjoy the course. Hi, I'm Darren Murph, Head of Remote at GitLab. I'm Jessica Reeder, All Remote Campaign Manager. Hi, I'm Candice Bertson williams Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging Manager here at GitLab. I'm David Sakamoto. I'm the Vice President of Customer Success. I'm Erica Flowers, Manager of the Digital Production Team. I'm Josh Zerman, Learning and Development Partner. So, fun fact, because GitLab is an all remote company, we only meet in person a few times a year if at all. On most days, it's just like this, on a Zoom call. This crew of folks will be your instructors throughout the course. Combined, we have decades of remote work experience and we're thrilled to share our learnings with you. The contents of this course are based on GitLab's extensive handbook, which is over 5,000 pages of publicly available open source information detailing exactly how we run the world's largest remote organization. Throughout this course, we will link back to the handbook and to other resources so that you can do your own research into the topics most valuable to you. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you throughout the course. In 2019, GitLab hired me as its head of remote. And as far as I know, I'm one of the first people in the world to hold that title. 
Even though not much time has passed since then, we are seeing this type of role become more and more common. Why? Because more companies are seriously considering and taking meaningful steps towards becoming not just remote friendly, but all remote organizations. The benefits of remote work are many. That doesn't mean it's an ideal solution, but we certainly believe it's going to become the default, not the exception. For example, remote teams can live and work all over the world. GitLab represents over 65 countries, and we know of organizations that have people in over 100 different countries. Remote work automatically allows for a more flexible schedule at almost every level and in every role in the organization. Not only do you lose your commute, but you gain time for your family and time to live your life. That comes with a mental shift. As you'll learn in this course, it's more effective to track results than attendance. And when you do that, it creates more happiness and empowerment for your team members. And as you'll learn in great detail soon, distributed organizations must be intentional about creating a culture that includes everyone and makes employees feel valued and appreciated. In 2020, we learned something else about remote work. As the world responded to the COVID-19 pandemic, people everywhere were forced into working from home. While that was not at all what we think of when we talk about intentionally being remote, it nonetheless helped us to see that operating as a distributed model is possible for many teams and many jobs. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if many of the people taking this course are doing so because your organization is planning a remote transition after a trial period. Even though that wasn't easy for anyone, it had a few positive outcomes, and we're glad you're here. We're now seeing universities like Harvard Business School and NC Ed teaching GitLab's remote strategies to business students. It's without a doubt the next wave, and whatever your reason is for taking this course, you'll gain knowledge and skills that will be incredibly valuable to your team, your organization, and your career. Remote work, distributed teams, telework, working from home, there are plenty of ways of talking about this way of working, and our terminology is continually evolving as we develop new practices, expectations, and systems. This course is designed to help you understand how a remote team operates, so you can support or lead one. To start with, let's run through some definitions and useful concepts. At its most essential, remote work is simply work that can be done from any location. A remote job is a job that doesn't require the worker to go to an office or workplace. Remote work typically requires a reliable, fast internet connection, appropriate equipment, and most importantly, good processes to empower the employee and organization to be effective without relying on physical proximity. In contrast, a co-located work environment is one where people inhabit the same space. A traditional office is a co-located environment. Co-located literally means shared location. In early 2020, just before the global coronavirus pandemic, GitLab surveyed about 3,000 adult professionals aged 21 or older who work remotely or have the option to work remotely and who are in roles with digital output. Here's what we learned. 43% of remote workers feel that it's important to work for a company where all employees are remote. More than one in four respondents belong to an all remote organization with no offices, embracing asynchronous workflows as each employee works in their own native time zone. An added 12% work all remote with each employee synced to a company mandated time zone. 86% of respondents believe remote work is the future but it's also the present, as evidenced by 84% of those surveyed saying that they are able to accomplish all of their tasks remotely right now. 62% of respondents said that they would consider leaving a co-located company for a remote role. For more remote work statistics, please see the GitLab Remote Work Report linked in the resources section. We've also identified some key factors that make remote work possible. It's important to recognize that people who don't have access to all of these may also have more difficulty adopting a remote work lifestyle. 
For inclusive hiring, think about where you may want to bridge some gaps. With all of that said, we also want to point out that this is a growing, evolving field. Remote work is different for every industry, organization, team, and individual, and it will be greatly changed in just a few years. Later in this course, we'll examine some of the different stages organizations can exist in and the structure of a remote transition. First, we'll look at the most essential element of any remote team, its people. For organizations looking to adopt remote strategies, there are a few key requirements. We'll get into detail throughout the course, but from a high level, here are the essential things you should start working to put into place. A remote transition plan. The goal of this course is to help you create a transition plan. That's because the process will be different for every team based on factors like company size, quantity of offices, percentage of employees who already work remotely, existing tools and technology infrastructure for operating remotely, existing culture surrounding communication and career mapping, and much more. Start by understanding where you're at now and where your organization wants to be in one year, five years, 10 years. Establish a remote leadership team. Shifting an entire division or company to remote triggers a shockwave of change. Evaluate current managers and rally a team of experts who have remote work experience and who are able to communicate nuances and to serve as resources to those who will inevitably have questions. A core part of this team's role will be to document challenges in real time, transparently prioritize those challenges, and assign directly responsible individuals to find solutions. Executive assistants may also take on a more significant role in the transition, functioning as a documentarian in meetings and aiding with internal communications cascaded to the rest of the organization. The quickest way to send the clearest signal that remote is the future is to start at the top of the organizational chart. We recommend making the executive team remote as soon as possible. Establish a remote infrastructure. Companies considering a transition to fully remote should ask themselves if they could function if every team member chose to work from their home tomorrow. To get an idea of what needs to be in place from a tools and technology standpoint, consider the following questions in light of the aforesaid scenario. What voids would become apparent? What areas of communication would falter? What confusion would emerge? What tools do we use today that we could continue to use as a fully remote team? What tools that empower fully remote teams should we consider? Companies that rely on in-office meetings will likely need to embrace a new paradigm, leveraging video meetings and cloud calendaring. Consider the current adoption rate of these tools within your team. Is everyone using them? Are they being used in the same ways? If you aren't sure, start auditing these systems now. Enabling access to systems and files across a fully remote company can be very different and may require a new approach to security. Consult with your security team and consider an in-depth audit of your systems and tools to avoid common security flaws. Establish a handbook. This will be rudimentary to start but start it anyway. Consider your handbook a living document which will serve as a single source of truth for more pressing questions. Share the handbook company-wide and update it continually. This can start as a single company webpage or wiki and it will grow to serve you well as long as it's kept current. GitLab uses GitLab to build, sustain, and evolve its company handbook. It's certainly a good idea to implement a tool that has version tracking and other features that were developed to allow many people to work on a single piece of documentation. Empower your team to contribute to your handbook and it will grow more quickly and stay more up to date. One of the most sizable challenges when going remote is keeping everyone informed. We will discuss this in detail later in the course. 
we urge you to take documentation seriously from the start. Establish a communication plan. Documentation doesn't cover the more time-sensitive or high-impact communications you'll want to share throughout your remote transition. Get your communications and HR teams involved early to discuss how to message any major changes. Whatever your current view on transparency, leaders should not hold back during this time. It's vital to maintain perspective through this shift, and leaders should prioritize communication. Everyone reacts to remote work differently. This can and likely will feel jarring, and team members will expect frequent updates as leaders iterate on their communication plan in real time. For a fast boot on this front, consider replicating GitLab's public communication guide. During the transition, depending on your team's size, consider an always-on video conference room for each team where team members can linger or come and go as they please. This simulation helps acclimation, enabling team members to embrace the shift to remote in a less jarring way. It also shows intentionality around informal communication, an important element that occurs spontaneously in an office and needs an immediate replacement in a remote setting. Drive change. Humans are naturally resistant to change, particularly change that is forced during times of uncertainty or crisis. Leaders will have to meet this reality head on. An all hands approach to recognizing the new reality is advised, and it's vital to empowering everyone to contribute to the success of a remote model. Particularly for companies with a strong in-office experience, it's vital for leadership to recognize that the remote transition is a process, not a binary switch to be flipped. Leaders are responsible for embracing iteration, being open about what is and is not working, and messaging this to all employees. Managing a remote company is much like managing any company. It comes down to trust, communication, and company-wide support of shared goals. In future lessons, we'll share more detail on essential practices including communication, project management, a results mindset, evaluation, career development, and leadership. When you start building a global team, the first thing you should expect to shift is your mindset. In this lesson, we're going to cover some of the major changes you should take into account. There were over 500 candidates for my job, and that is the norm for a remote role. You now have access to a global pool of applicants. You're no longer limited by who's in your area or who's willing to relocate. That comes with many benefits, and it comes with some challenges. The most obvious benefit is that you can hire the people who are truly the best fit for the role and for your organization. And the challenge arising directly from this is that if you truly want to attract people from everywhere, you may need to bridge some cultural barriers. Help potential candidates understand what you're offering by transparently sharing the details of the job, including the salary range and the benefits, so that anyone who's interested can assess the opportunity. Please see our recommended reading for more on why this is important for effective, inclusive hiring practices. Likewise, make it easy for candidates to find information about your company's culture and your ways of working. We'll cover culture in more detail later in this course, but for now, just put yourself in the shoes of an international applicant. What do they need to know about working for your company? What will they experience? Help them understand. From privacy laws to labor laws to restrictions on access, there are many important details to consider as you move into global hiring. Generally, most organizations will not choose to incorporate in every country where they have a presence, particularly if they have only a few employees there. Instead, you need to weigh the benefits of various other options, which can be more or less attractive from country to country. GitLab currently maintains legal entities in some countries while hiring professional employer organizations elsewhere to serve as the employer of record and to facilitate payments. We also leverage contractor agreements where other options aren't viable. 
Take this information into account as you plan to expand your applicant pool and be aware that there will be some places in the world where the obstacles may be too great and you may not be able to hire even the most qualified individuals. For the rest, have a plan, be transparent, be inclusive, and you will receive all the advantages of working with a truly global workforce. Once you've posted the opportunity and applications begin to roll in, how should you assess candidates for a remote position? How should you conduct interviews? And what should you ask? Hiring can be a complex, nuanced process, but if you approach it with forethought and strategy, you can discover team members who will thrive remotely and who will help support a strong team culture. For hiring managers who are accustomed to doing in-person interviews, there's often concern about how you'll be able to assess a candidate's intangible qualities, in particular, the popular concept of culture fit via remote interviews. Here's how we approach this process for our team of over 1,300 people. First, work with recruiters who have remote experience, including some who may have worked in hybrid remote environments and who understand the challenges and negative experiences that candidates may have had in that format. Next, instead of culture fit, adjust your thinking to focus on values. Later in this course, we'll discuss developing strong company values and why. When you have clear values for your team, you can discuss them in the interview with candidates and learn how those concepts resonate. Instead of looking for team members you'd want to socialize with, which can lead to biased thinking, instead look for people who are able and willing to work with your value system and to apply your values independently in the course of their work. Ultimately, new team members shouldn't be fitting into a rigid structure. They should be adding to your culture with values as a foundation. That can be a difficult concept to grasp, so let's get more specific. It isn't necessary for you to hire people who have previous experience working remotely. In fact, some people who may have worked in a hybrid remote environment may have had bad experiences or could be bringing faulty expectations about how a healthy remote team operates. Instead, look for people who have experience working independently and with autonomy. Focus on candidates who have a history of being self-motivated, starting, leading, and completing projects with little direction. While people who aren't self-motivated can enjoy remote work, they will usually require more check-ins and more synchronous communication, which can slow things down in a remote environment. Most people who come from traditional work environments are used to micromanagement. Whether you're hiring an individual contributor or a manager of people, look for people who would do the opposite. You want someone who is confident in making decisions without the details being entirely clear and unafraid to adjust things during the process, what we call iteration. Finally, look for excellent communication skills. In a remote environment, the ability to communicate clearly through writing is going to come into play every single day. And because there will also be video and phone calls, your ideal candidate should be able to express themselves clearly and succinctly. Conduct interviews exactly in the format you'll be using to work together, written messages and video calls, in order to get a sense for how communication will work. When conducting an interview, keep in mind that panel style interviews don't work well remotely. Even if the interviewers are in a room together, it's an awkward experience. Instead, stick to one-on-one -on -one interviews over video or phone with preference given to video calls. In some cultures, this can be challenging for interviewers as well as interviewees. So ensure everyone involved is well prepared. Please see our linked resources on how to communicate expectations so that candidates can prepare for the interview. Here are some of our recruiters' recommended questions. Keep in mind that there aren't always right and wrong answers to these questions, but that they're designed to help you understand a candidate more effectively. To create a universally inclusive interview process, especially when hiring globally, we recommend having your interviewers and your recruiters regularly complete implicit bias training. But it's also important to create a level playing field for candidates. 
always offer candidates the option to reserve a co-working space, a laptop, or any other resources they need to conduct the interview with the costs reimbursed confidentially. And always remind your interviewers that candidates may not be calling from an ideal environment. Excuse background noise, excuse connection problems, and excuse any other issues. Keep your focus on the candidate, not their environment. I have a background in creative work which for many people means we have home studios in addition to, or as our sole workplaces. I also work with independent contractors who typically conduct business out of their home offices. In fact, people who are new to remote work can learn a lot from the creative industries, as well as from the medical, psychology, and human resources fields. You don't need a traditional office space to work, but there are some things that most people would consider necessities. Plan and budget to make those things available to your team. Remember that by losing the overhead of a physical office, you save quite a lot of money, far more than you would spend on one-time purchases for equipment, furniture, and other necessities that will raise your team's satisfaction and productivity. The most important thing we all need is the ability to focus without interruptions and distractions. In fact, home offices can be better for this than the traditional office, as long as you have a designated workspace with a door that can close. For some people, that workspace can be as simple as a chair and a table. Others may need a room of their own. While we all love our families and what they add to our lives, we all need to be able to signal when we're working and can't be disturbed. A door serves that purpose, and it also helps to reduce any noise that can distract while you're working. It's crucial for people to be physically comfortable, not just for productivity, but for their long-term health. As an employer, you should feel responsible for ensuring people have access to ergonomic workspaces. That includes good lighting, which is important for mental health. You may also want to consider climate control. Is your office space hot in the summer or cold in the winter? If all these elements aren't available in the home space, then it's a good idea for employees to work in a co-working space or another spot outside of the home. Plan to reimburse co-working spaces and other memberships for team members who request them. On the other hand, some of the things we take for granted aren't needed. The most obvious is the shared office space. Some people like going into an office but that's a matter of personal preference or relevance to their role, not a universal need. Also take into account that people won't always be in the same spot. Remote work creates flexibility. Make sure your team members know what you expect from them and give them leeway to travel, co-work, or create other flexible arrangements. In fact, a distributed team, you may want to encourage people to travel and meet each other in person. Consider creating travel stipends for people visiting their coworkers. If you have team members who travel consistently, offer them a coworking membership. Finally, later in this course, we'll talk about asynchronous work. Keep in mind that a flexible schedule allows people to prioritize their lives and families, which is one of the biggest workspace improvements you can offer. Think back to your first day at your most recent job. What was the experience like? How were you introduced to your team? What tasks did you start with? Now, put yourself in the shoes of someone starting a new job remotely from their home or from a co-working space. What does that look like? There are no in-person meetings, no office tours. They just sit down at a computer and log in. So how will they begin taking on their new role? Remote onboarding is so new and so different from traditional onboarding that there isn't yet an accepted best practice. Every organization will do this somewhat differently, yet it's very important to do it well. According to Glassdoor, strong onboarding practices can increase retention by as much as 82%. The most effective thing you can do is to give onboarding time, space, and focus. 
Without the ability to make someone feel welcome through in-person meetings, you can demonstrate to them that you value their time by giving them an excellent onboarding experience. Reserve at least the first week, ideally two weeks, simply for your new hire to onboard into their role. Onboarding should focus on three key dimensions, organizational, technical, and social. Organizational knowledge covers logistical questions such as signing up for benefits, but also things like how to seek information, career progression, and performance expectations. Technical knowledge includes equipment setup, learning new tools, security, and so forth. And social knowledge covers organizational culture, behavioral norms, communication style, and team relationships. In remote work, the first day begins with technical setup. If, like GitLab, you will be issuing a computer or other tools to new hires, the people team must start preparing before the hire's first day so that they'll have what they need to begin their job promptly. Standardize this process and work with your IT team to ensure strong security practices from the very beginning. As an example, a new hire may receive an email telling them how to access their work account. Once they activate the work account, they will immediately be asked to set up multi-factor authentication and to install essential software via verified sources. All of this access must be provisioned in advance. The first day can be a very dry experience, which is necessary for security and access. Expect a new hire to spend at least half their first day simply installing software, creating accounts, and completing security checks. Standardize this process to ensure compliance and make sure all team members have the information they need. We do this by creating an onboarding issue, also known as a ticket or project, which is built using a template and assigned to the new hire as a checklist of required tasks. While most of the essential tasks should be standardized, you will have some customization based on the new team member's role and their location. For example, we have different processes for employees than we do for contractors. We have extra security training for engineers and people who have access to sensitive intellectual property. And of course, we'll have different legal documents to ensure compliance in the individual's country of residence. Make sure that your technical onboarding is inclusive of people with varying backgrounds and abilities. While you should empower people to ask for additional support or help if they encounter challenges, it's ideal for them to not need to ask. Onboarding information should include clear instructions on how team members can acquire workspace, equipment, and tools to be able to do their job and how to expense it. Remember, an individual's workspace needs to be functional for their work, and the one-time expense to set up a home office is vastly less costly than monthly rent on an office space. Be generous. Organizational onboarding can begin on the first day as well, and it should be a focus throughout the first week. This includes the Code of Conduct and the Company Handbook. Give new hires the opportunity and the incentive to read and understand these materials. Be aware that in many countries, you can't legally require new hires to complete any tasks before they officially start their job. Make the space for them to study and learn on company time. While your new member should be required to perform specific tasks in the first few days, part of their organizational training should include moving them into a self-directed, self-enabled way of working. If you've hired with a focus on independent motivation, you should find that team members are seeking out information and connections on their own within a few days. Encourage this behavior. For example, at GitLab, we ask new hires to add themselves to the team webpage, which requires doing some self-directed learning. Assign a variety of tasks to help people gain new skills they'll need. For anyone who will be managing people, include manager training. Even if your new manager is highly experienced, managing remotely requires a high level of competency and cultural awareness. Enforce standardization, and you'll be empowering managers to work together and to support your organization's values and norms. Social onboarding can also start as soon as the first day. A new team member should meet with their supervisor and their team for a welcome call as soon as possible. 
Use these calls for informal connection and relationship building, but also to enforce some basic norms. For example, call etiquette, such as how meeting time is managed and whether employees keep their video cameras turned on during calls. In a distributed team, social onboarding is key. It should be a focus for at least the first month. GitLab maintains chat channels and AMA or Q&A calls for new team members, as well as using a Slack bot called Donut to introduce random team members for networking social calls. We encourage coffee chats, which are work-free conversations between any two people. Encourage these sorts of interactions consistently. Some new hires will be introverted or intimidated seeking out social connections. Make this easy and you'll raise performance and retention rates as a result of creating a welcoming atmosphere. Include formal cultural training in this process. Later in this course, we'll discuss culture and values. Having a clear set of cultural expectations is useful for new hires. Require them to read and acknowledge culture information as part of onboarding. Finally, Assign an onboarding buddy within the first week. This should be an experienced team member whose role is to answer questions, offer support, and provide context. Microsoft found that up to 97% of new hires who had an onboarding buddy found the experience to be helpful. In a remote environment, it can't be overstated how much a new team member will benefit from having a go-to person they can reach out to with questions. We have a formal onboarding buddy program, which you can read about in the linked resources below. As social onboarding continues, encourage your new team member to share their interests and bring their full self to the team. Host interest-based chat channels and social calls, point people toward relevant resource groups, and give them time off to volunteer or to participate in causes and activities that are important to them. Work cannot replace a person's social and family life, but your team members should be comfortable to share more about the people they are outside the office. This doesn't always come naturally in remote work, so make an effort to encourage self-expression and model it. Onboarding can make or break a new team member, but they may not always feel comfortable speaking up when things aren't going well. Close the loop by collecting feedback consistently as the final step in an onboarding process. After an employee's first few weeks, follow up to ask for onboarding feedback. This is a valuable opportunity to identify dissatisfaction or burnout, as well as to strengthen your processes. Survey onboarding buddies as well, and allow people to give feedback anonymously. Analyze your data across regions, across functions, teams, roles, Identify any trends and areas of improvement. We've just started to scratch the surface of how remote work is an entirely different experience than the traditional office environment. Now, I'm sure you've already discovered something you didn't know or changed your thinking towards remote work. That's the experience of remote leadership. We are all learning all the time. This week, you learn the essentials of why people work remotely and why more people are doing it now more than ever. We talked about hiring, interviewing, and onboarding without a single in-person meeting. And we looked at what it means to create an effective at-home workspace for each of your team members. Please join in the discussion in the forums and help yourself to the additional resources we have linked below. Next week, we will explore management through the lens of remote. See you all then. Let me ask you a question. Is it more important to communicate information clearly or to communicate it without causing discomfort to other people? That's a trick question because the answer is both. And that is just one way in which communication is the biggest challenge for most organizations. In the remote environment, the challenge is only amplified. Later in this module, we're going to talk about the details of asynchronous communication. 
But what it effectively means is that people are on different schedules and different time zones. So you may send a message, but it won't be read for several hours or even days. If you don't develop strong communication practices, this can cause pervasive problems and delays. Cross-cultural communication is a subtle art and nobody does it perfectly. People have different expectations and that can lead to misunderstandings. Meanwhile, people who aren't in an office can quickly become lonely and feel excluded, which leads directly to burnout and dissatisfaction. At GitLab, one of our main areas of team focus is on having robust communication practices. We do this in many ways. Our primary tactics are to intentionally be transparent in all communications, to consistently create opportunities for informal communication, and to rigorously document everything. And when all that fails, we approach misunderstandings with the idea that everyone is on the same team with a positive intent. Most organizations are the opposite of transparent, so we know this is a big ask, but can you imagine what it would look like to share information openly, at least internally among your team? GitLab is an open core company, so we're transparent by default. And as a result, we believe that we're more efficient. People can find the information they need quickly without having to ask. They use our company handbook or our project management systems. If you don't have transparent communication, you are duplicating work and you are creating a blocker for people. So take a good hard look at your intellectual property and your documentation and ask yourself, how much of this could we make transparent and what would we gain from that? Different cultures and groups communicate differently. Low context communication is an approach that's designed to be inclusive of everyone, no matter their background or experience. The idea behind it is to act as if the people you're talking to have no additional context available to them. Give them the full information with links to additional reading if needed, so there's no time or effort wasted and they can act quickly without misunderstandings and false steps. As a leader, this puts the burden on you to communicate more clearly. Will it slow you down? In the moment, yes. But the alternative is communicating quickly and not giving full information, and that slows your entire team down, much less efficient in the end. Imagine you're based in Asia and your team member is in North America. You have a question about something in their area of expertise, so you write down the question and send it to them. But you may not read their response for a full day. And what if you have a follow-up question? Or imagine if you are a manager and one of your direct reports needs some information while you're in the middle of something. You now need to stop what you're doing and go find the answer, otherwise your report is blocked. Now, imagine you have a single source of truth, a complete home for documenting all the information your team members might need to know, which is kept up to date. The team member on a different time zone won't need to wait, and the manager won't have to break their workflow. Individuals can find the information they need right away without having to ask at all. In the next lesson, you'll learn what it means to have rigorous, transparent documentation and how that can improve inclusivity, efficiency, and communication throughout your organization. Communication breaks down. That is a normal, routine experience in the workplace, so we plan for it. GitLab encourages team members to assume that everyone is working towards shared goals and that we all want the best for the organization and for each other. When we have a misunderstanding, we focus on the positive and work to resolve it. It's surprising how far this shift in attitude can take you. Give it a try. Time is valuable and team meetings can be expensive. We like to think about synchronous meetings in terms of their ROI. In other words, if we've gone to the trouble of pulling everyone away from their workflow, how will we make sure we are adding value? Done well, meetings and collaboration sessions are hugely valuable and well worth the time. Here are some best practices to ensure your team is calling meetings for the right reasons and making them as impactful as possible. Every meeting must have an agenda. 
An agenda prevents knowledge leaks and creates a record of what was discussed. This shifts the memorization burden away from humans. If there is an agenda document affixed to each calendar invite, for example, you can easily search your calendar for keywords like marketing, CEO, engineering, etc. You can find a given meeting and immediately access a documented history of what was discussed. An agenda also creates a more inclusive meeting atmosphere. People can add questions and insights before and even after a synchronous meeting. This is inclusive of people on different time zones who may not be able to be there in person. Plus, those who are less comfortable verbalizing points in front of management can use the agenda document to properly articulate their complete thoughts. Finally, an agenda creates a takeaway. The agenda document lives longer after the meeting and it's easy to add action items. During the meeting itself, take comprehensive notes in the agenda document. It's not rude to focus on documentation in a meeting. In fact, a surefire way to waste time in a meeting is to avoid writing anything down. Meetings within an all remote company require documentation to be worthwhile. Also, always record the meeting. You can always delete an unwanted meeting recording, but it's better to have the option to keep it if you decide you want to access or share it later. This is particularly important if you want to present or wish to have a written transcription of the meeting. Zoom's cloud recording supports transcription natively, and Otter is another popular transcription tool. Start on time and end on time. Meetings pull everyone away from their normal workflow, and after the meeting ends, a non-trivial amount of time is required for each attendee to regain focus on their tasks. While it's not always possible to schedule meetings in a way that they don't break up the flow of an ongoing project, it is important to begin and end meetings on time in order to minimize disruptions. When scheduling a meeting, we also value people's time and choose the speeding meetings setting in our Google calendars. This gives us meetings of, for example, 25 or 50 minutes, leaving some time at the end to write notes, stretch, etc. before continuing to the next call or meeting. How do you solve the problem of multitasking during a meeting? Many organizations struggle with this, and a common tactic is to require attendees to turn off other devices, mute their notifications, and remain focused on the meeting at hand. As an alternative, we recommend the exact opposite. At GitLab, we allow each team member to be the manager of their attention. It's completely acceptable to work on other tasks if what's happening in a meeting doesn't apply to you. Does this mean that occasionally we have to ask for something to be repeated? Yes, but we accept that as a normal occurrence. It's not embarrassing to ask for something to be repeated because you manage your own attention. You're free to engage with other work and then be pulled back into a relevant part of the meeting conversation. This reduces stress for people who have lots of meetings on their calendars and in a remote environment, that is a common experience. This also means that some people will skip meetings when they have other priorities. That's another reason that you should aim to record all meetings, particularly when key individuals aren't able to join live. This allows team members to catch up on what transpired, adding context to notes that were taken during the meeting. Likewise, cancel unnecessary recurring meetings. Recurring meetings are often established as meaningful points along a given journey but don't hesitate to cancel them after their purpose has been served. Canceling meetings isn't an insult to the attendees. In fact, they'll probably appreciate having that time to focus on their priority work. A hybrid call means that you have a physical room with some meeting attendees sitting in it together while other attendees are remote. Hybrid calls should be avoided. It's much better to have everyone on a level playing field for communication and discussion. If a hybrid call must happen, however, everyone should use their own equipment, including cameras, headsets, and screens, even if they're physically sitting in the same room. This ensures that everyone is on the same playing field in terms of call experience. If possible, it's best to separate briefly and take the call from separate workspaces, creating a 100% remote call experience. This may seem a little silly to teams who aren't accustomed to remote work, but the experience is much more equal and inclusive, and ultimately it empowers everyone, including remote attendees. 
In a co-located setting, collaboration often happens face-to-face -face with a whiteboard on hand in a conference room. Working remotely sometimes feels like working on your own, with your own calendar, your own schedule, and your own documents. But with a common goal, with some strategic planning, and with the right brainstorming tools, collaborating in a remote environment can be just as productive as collaborating in an office. Remote teams should aim to minimize their tool stack. It's good practice to consider how you can extract additional value from tools you already use. Google Docs is a great example of this. While Google Docs is a fantastic shared editing tool, GitLab also uses it as a remote whiteboarding tool. Everyone can write, not just the most senior people in the room. Multiple people can write at the same time. You can see what people are looking at, you can make suggestions, add screenshots and embeds, and even link to external resources. Of course, there are also multiple online design and whiteboard tools such as Mural and Figma, which are more visually oriented and allow for collaboration. Your design and product teams are likely to need a more sophisticated experience than the rest of the organization. For deep dives on how GitLab's UX and design teams collaborate remotely, please see our linked resources. When I'm consulting with companies who are testing the waters of remote work, one question comes up time and time again. How do we monitor when our employees are working? What if they're playing games or surfing the internet during work? How will we know? Traditional offices typically rely on tracking employee attendance. They ask, are people in their seats? And then they assume, well, they're probably working. But in remote work, there's no real way for you to gauge whether people are present or what they're doing at any given time. Some companies are testing out surveillance systems. They're actually monitoring team member screens to check what they're up to. Now, if that idea makes you uncomfortable, you certainly aren't alone. Employees tend to feel that this is an invasion of privacy and it overall lowers morale. Other organizations try to track output. For example, how many emails did you send during your shift? That's possible to quantify, but does it really tell the real story? Or are you just encouraging people to spam? The truth is, there's no great way to monitor employee activity while treating the people with the respect that they deserve. Instead, we recommend asking yourself this. What do we really want to understand? For most people, it's this. The results of the work, not the minute-to-minute -minute activities of individuals. What you really want to know is, how well are my team members contributing to business goals? And for that, measuring attendance or activity is useless. Later in this course, we'll talk about how strong team values create a culture of success and high performance. But you'll see the first example now. GitLab's most important value is that of results. Above all else, the result of our work is what truly matters. Many companies these days use an OKR system to achieve results systematically, and so does GitLab. By setting up a system of written objectives and key results that all ladder up to business objectives, we can make sure that each team member knows how they are individually contributing to a shared goal. Once you have goals outlined, then you can implement regular review cycles. Employees can be evaluated on how well they are reaching their goals, which is much more useful to them personally and to the organization. OKRs help with collaboration because there's a transparent understanding of the objectives. For example, you could negotiate with, I can't give you X resources, but let's take a look at what the priorities are. But it's not a perfect system. As with any goal-oriented system, OKRs can compete, conflict, and even block each other. It's not up to the individual team members to set goals without conflicts. Rather, it's a manager's job to check for potential blocks and help to free your team members' forward motion. This is where communication comes back into the conversation. Make sure your team member is encouraged to work with others instead of competing or becoming siloed and help your team understand that they're all working towards the same outcomes. And as a leader, help them be strong contributors. In the end, would you rather spend your time monitoring employee attendance 
or helping them be more effective and raising the output overall of your team? The answer should be clear. Assessing performance and job satisfaction can often be more challenging without the daily in-person interactions that many people managers rely on. Let's look at a few of the common issues that can arise for remote employees and how to implement systems that help empower team members to thrive and advance in their careers. Newly remote employees and managers may have a tendency to mimic the in-person office culture in a remote setting. They can bring with them many of the habits they learned in their corporate organization. Be aware of the learned behaviors that, while you may not be encouraging or promoting them, can still become pervasive. You already know that communication is a challenge at every level of a remote organization. At the individual level in particular, people feel pressured to communicate synchronously. Most people instinctively respond as quickly as they can to a message from a manager or a teammate. Many managers also expect quick responses. Particularly among team members who have worked in traditional corporate environments, it can be difficult to avoid the urge to check messages or respond to notifications well past normal work hours. This leads directly to stress and burnout. Meanwhile, cross-cultural communication is often more important and therefore more challenging in a global distributed team. People who have only worked with others from similar cultures often aren't aware of more subtle cultural differences that can block inclusivity and collaboration. It can be a challenge to maintain inclusivity and to encourage team members to develop more awareness and perspective for what their teammates around the world are accustomed to. Finally, many people will initially be uncomfortable with the level of transparent communication required in a remote environment. Managers and leaders in particular might revert to private messages, hidden meeting agendas, and so forth. This quickly blocks information flow and creates an atmosphere of non-inclusion. For many people who work remotely, the home and the office are the same place. Sometimes it can be difficult to let go and truly be off work. However, when people don't take time off, they become less efficient, less happy, and ultimately they can burn out. Taking time to recharge and time off should be communicated from the top of an organization and modeled at every level. Leaders should be advocates for paid time off, what we call PTO, and should actively encourage everyone to use theirs. In a remote setting, it can be difficult to detect burnout and dissatisfaction. As a manager, you need to build a safe environment where team members feel comfortable bringing up issues of overwork or burnout. You do not have as many opportunities remotely to check in on your people. Encourage managers to use one-on-one -on -one meetings as personal check-ins. Create guidelines that include asking teammates how they're feeling and how their workload is. Likewise, team meetings shouldn't be all business. Ensure your team members make time in their weekly meetings to get to know each other better. Getting to know people remotely may take twice as long to build relationships, so it's essential to create opportunities for this to happen, supporting better team cohesion. Team building should be done at the team level. While team members should also have regular coffee chats or one-on-one -on -one calls, always prioritize inclusive team building as a group. A lack of career mobility can block motivation, while teams with active skills development programs can be more engaged and more effective. Implement learning and development tools and practices throughout the year, regularly offering opportunities to learn new skills or tools. This is valuable not just because it helps upskill your existing team members, but because it increases motivation and performance. Likewise, Use your handbook to document career pathways for every role and function. Particularly in a distributed team, people may not know where their job pathway can lead them, and they may be uncomfortable asking. Provide clear documentation to empower people to thrive and build longer careers with your organization. There are many tools and practices to address the challenges we've just discussed. One of the most powerful tools you can implement is a strong, supportive feedback cycle. 
As a leader, you'll need to create an environment where team members feel empowered to take their career to new heights. Employee evaluations are an important part of a remote organization. Evaluations often consist of performance analysis that is used in employee improvement as well as internal promotions and pay raises. At GitLab, we use annual 360 reviews. These are the basis for our annual performance evaluations and our primary method of documenting formal feedback. This feedback is implemented in the promotion process as well and is a prerequisite for promotion. We use this to gain a clear understanding of an individual's strengths and development. 360 reviews are done asynchronously. Over the course of several weeks, every team member gives and receives feedback through a secure tool. Then the feedback is reviewed between the individual and their supervisor and a relevant action plan is created. In between the annual reviews, we encourage active feedback sharing and proactively share best practices for doing so. Feedback should be given in real time whenever possible. For positive feedback, thanks, and praise, we encourage using a public channel. Praise should be given in front of an audience unless the team member being praised isn't comfortable with that. For negative feedback, we recommend giving it privately, either in a face-to-face -face call or via private message. Strong handbook documentation is essential to this process. Make sure it's easy for team members to find out what to do if they have a problem or a piece of feedback. It should also be clearly documented how feedback can affect an individual's career trajectory. We have all this information easily accessible to team members. As a reminder, it's easy for people to feel lonely, isolated, or invisible in a remote environment. One easy way to combat this is to encourage managers to give frequent recognition and praise. This helps employees know that their work is valued and understood. Hi everyone, I'm Jessica Reeder, All Remote Campaign Manager at GitLab, and I'm here speaking with Eric Johnson, Executive Vice President of Engineering, also at GitLab. And we're going to talk today about uh, remote leadership and why that is different from traditional leadership, what remote leaders need to know. So, Eric, hello, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Great to have you. So, let's jump right in and start by talking about how remote leadership is generally different from leading an in-office team. Sure, yeah, I think um, one of the things that comes to mind is uh, my wife's field, psychology, and she's taught me quite a bit about it. Um, and, and one of the most significant things I've learned from her is how people learn. Um, and so the first, the primary way people learn is really by observing the behaviors that the leaders they're around are modeling. Um, and uh, secondly, is what is coming out of those leaders' mouths, what, you, what they're telling them to do. Uh, and then a distant third is sort of negative incentives or punishments, and that really doesn't work at all, so I, I wouldn't advise doing that. But I think leaders commonly forget about the first one. Another way to say it would be, you know, walk the walk and, and talk the talk, that sort of, uh, that sort of phrase. But uh, the idea, for instance, is, you know, if you're telling them, hey, take vacation time or something like that, if you're not doing that yourselves, they're going to get a strong signal that it's really not okay to do that. So you need to be cognizant of that and not just take it, but al almost do what it, some leaders find uncomfortable, which is advertise things like that. So I happen to be uh, about to take a, a staycation next week. And uh, I've got it in my staff meeting and I keep reminding people whether it's a skip level meeting or something like that. Like, hey, it's up. I'm taking a vacation. It's not because I'm, I'm being flashy and, and letting them know that, uh, you know, I, I get to take time off is that I'm signaling them, hey, uh, it's genuinely okay. We're telling people to take vacation, but also we're doing it ourselves and that, uh, that they should as well to take care of their mental health, their family and these other these other things. Um, and I think this becomes even more important in a remote environment because you have less time uh, in front of your employees. And so you have to really uh, pay close attention to those moments where you are in front of them and make sure you're modeling the things that you're telling them uh, you want them to, to do. Um, so that's one. The other thing that it seems to be unique about remote work is that, um, you know, I, I view um, 
detecting burnout as a management and a leadership responsibility. And that is um, that much harder to see in a remote environment. When you're in person or on premise, you see behaviors like in the engineering context where someone is uh, showing up five minutes late to the stand up, you know, every day in a week or something like that. And you pick up on these subtleties. Um, you don't have those sort of subtle avenues to get that information. And so you need to be more deliberate. You need to be asking those questions in uh, one-on-ones and you need to be looking for, uh, for other behaviors. And you really need to be coaching your employees to manage their own time um, and their own burnout and, you know, schedule, uh, schedule a walk in the afternoon or, or as I mentioned, take vacation time and whatnot. But uh, be cognizant that um, that's going to become a, more of a challenge is making sure your employees don't burn themselves out. Um, another thing is um, when you're remote, uh, you really have to focus on asynchronous work. Um, people need to um, uh, be able to work independently on things. And so you have to focus on work breakdown, um, take a large project, break it up into chunks, something that someone can take offline for half a day, a day, a week, and come back with a result, and then integrate that result with the pieces that their teammates have been working on so that you complete the project together. So work breakdown uh, or work shaping um, is, uh, is that much more important in a remote organization. Um, and when people are working asynchronously, um, you know, you have to be cognizant of, you know, every time you're, you're faced with a challenge or a new workflow, we have to think about like, how can we, how can we get this to work in an asynchronous fashion, but then also be cognizant that when that stops working, you do have to use synchronous modes of communication, like a, a relatively expensive Zoom meeting. And I say expensive because if you've got people in different time zones, you have to make sure they're all awake and working at the same time. And that can be hard to achieve. You don't want to do that. Uh, very often or uh, more often than you need to. Um, so the idea is um, be async sort of by default, work hard to create uh, async workflows for new challenges, and then be cognizant of when it stops working for you and when you need to fall back to relatively more expensive modes of communication. Um, and then uh, another thing that uh, we see because people happen to be going uh, remote in sort of emergency fashion currently, um, is uh, there's an instinct amongst managers that people might not be working as hard and that uh, they, they should purchase some form of employee monitoring software. And um, what I would coach leaders to understand is that um, we actually see the opposite behavior. We're seeing people work uh, much harder than usual, which means I, I advise people, you know, it's a natural instinct to have, but skip the monitoring software and we should actually focus on is coaching people to um, not work so hard that they're burning themselves out. There's a lot of stressors going on in the current environment and um, you want people to be productive over long time spans, not in sort of uh, fits and starts or short bursts of, of uh, artificial productivity. Um, so be cognizant of that, you know, skip the, the monitoring software and focus on uh, managing burnout, coaching vacation time, those other things I mentioned. Yeah, and I think that, um, you know, the wish to monitor employees comes from a good place. It's wanting to make sure that you're leading effectively and that people are able to do their work, that they're able to be productive and that goals are going to be met. But it's different in the remote environment. So when a leader is working through this transition or getting ready to lead a distributed team, what's, uh, what are some ways they can educate themselves and become more knowledgeable and prepared? Yeah, that's uh, that's well said. I would say it's it's just uh, it's it's sort of a crutch you can lean on when you're in an on-premise office environment. It's natural to use the fact that you can sort of see the production floor as part of your management style, and just be aware that you won't have that when you go remote, and you need to build a, a different set of skills to to manage the, the productivity and uh, engagement of your team. Um, so. Um, I think the GitLab handbook is a, is a great resource. We, uh, we publish it for ourselves, but for transparency, we make it available to everybody. And there's a lot of, uh, a lot of information in there. Um, you know, I would caveat it and say that uh, we're all remote and we've been doing this a long time. So there is a level of detail in there that may not be useful for you, depending on what time horizon you plan to be uh, remote or what your long-term goals are. Um, so try to focus on the things that are um, really important um, uh, when you're doing this for the first time uh, or um, if you're doing it sort of in an in emergency fashion. Um, you know, remote is new. So while there's hundreds of hours and business schools devoted to how to manage or how to lead 
um, traditional companies, um, there's not as much content out there. So uh, aside from the, the, the GitLab handbook, um, lots of videos and other types of uh, publishing that's going on, um, don't, don't forget to um, talk to your network. And so reach out on LinkedIn um, and uh, uh, sort of mine the knowledge of the people you've connected with throughout your career and try to draw from them what's working for them and then integrate that into your, um, into your organization. Um, also, don't skip the opportunity to do this internal to the company. It's not just what other companies are doing, but it's um, uh, about what other leaders in your organization are doing. And one of the things that happens at a remote company is um, silos sort of naturally develop um, because you're not, uh, you know, you don't have those opportunities at the water cooler, in the hallway, uh, at the lunch table to understand what's going on in different functions. So you have to be a lot more deliberate about broadcasting what your functional area is doing you want to encourage other leaders to do the same and then make sure you and your people are consuming that, uh, that information. So one of the things we've done at GitLab is um, we've developed this, this uh, process around daily group conversation. So a group converse, conversation is any sort of functional bit of the org. Um, they do a, a short presentation and then it hopefully quickly goes into sort of a Q&A about the things that they're uh, working on, uh, their priorities uh, in the moment, um, and, uh, and how maybe what they need from, from other groups. And so, um, and this is specifically meant to take the place of the fact that you're not getting that sort of organically from an office environment. So I encourage uh, leaders to be very deliberate about that cross communication and, um, and making it happen in a, in a somewhat formalized way. Yeah, well said. That's an excellent recommendation. And I, I do love those calls. Um, and it also provides a way for people throughout the company to get a little bit of an idea of what's happening. Uh, what are some other specific actions that leaders can take, say they're entering a remote transition um, or planning to take on a remote team? What are a few specific things they can do right away? Yeah, I think um, it's important to acknowledge that communication is a challenge. It's a challenge at uh, any company. Um, but I think it becomes more of a challenge in, in remote. I mean, we're big believers that uh, all, being all remote is a net benefit to the company, but it doesn't mean every aspect gets easier. And I think this is one of those individual aspects that gets harder. So we've had to strategize around it. So one of the things we say in engineering is um, we need uh, managers and leaders to do what we call multimodal communication. So everything that is important that they need to communicate out to their teams, they need to be comfortable saying it um, three times in three different ways, let's say. And the, the point of diminishing returns is really when they start to feel like they're repeating themselves, it's probably just far enough. Um, and so um, we say that, you know, uh, if, you, if you do multimodal communication, you have to work really hard. And even then you probably realistically only reached about 80% of people. And when that thing, that change becomes real, you should still expect that that one person at least to raise their hand and say, Hey, I wasn't informed. And you know that you've, you've done your best. If it's not you that says, Oh, you know, we did broadcast this out. It's one of the person's peers that says it uh, to them. That's probably the best you can do. In fact, for something really important a while ago, we did a, a new process we called an act or acknowledgement. And um, we literally set up a Google form and it had a description of what we needed people to understand with a, I acknowledge it or I don't acknowledge this and I need to ask questions before I'm comfortable doing that. And the intent was literally get to 100% of people. And uh, the nice thing about having a Google form is we could sort of track that curve. And sure enough, um, with a couple of weeks of multimodal communication, we reached roughly about 80% of people. So the 80-20 rule was a good guess there. And then it took another 80% 80, 80 of the total time to get to those remaining 20% of, of people. So communication is really hard. It's not unique to GitLab or being an all remote company, but you do have to work harder in the, uh, in the remote context for sure. Um, other specific actions I could think of are, um, you know, make sure employees are investing in their workspace. Not everybody has an office at home. If you've got an employee who is, let's say, sitting on their couch, typing like this on their laptop, uh, they're not gonna be comfortable. They're not gonna be productive. Um, so I'd encourage you to look at your expense policy. It is a, it is a business expense uh, I would advocate and uh, make sure people are investing in having a nice webcam, having good lighting, having a workspace. Uh, maybe it's even uh, uh, outside of their home if they don't have the space in their home, uh, if it's safe for them to do that. Um, and to, uh, to treat that as you know, a replacement for the, the benefits you would give them if they were in the office. 
Um, the other thing is that a docu you know, your version of your documentation culture is really important. We've all been in those meetings where people are, you know, maybe it's a design change or something like that. And, and you realize you're talking past one another. Um, everybody's got different ideas about what the topic is in their head. And then you have a designer come in with an artifact that everybody could look at and suddenly it crystallizes. You're all talking about the same thing and you can suddenly make progress. The same thing is really important in other contexts. And so um, you need to work on your documentation culture. So you've got those artifacts, you've got the, the written version of whatever that process is or whatever that product changes, and um, it'll anchor those, uh, those conversations. Um, and another thing is, um, I think a lot of people view some sort of hybrid remote model as an iteration towards going all remote. Um, but I think having an on-premise office is easy in the ways we've described. Uh, and being all remote is also easy because it's a level playing field. Hybrid is actually sort of a danger zone in between those two things. And if you're treating it as a, as a way to potentially go all remote, you need to be cognizant that it's actually more difficult than all remote. Um, so for instance, if you have a team uh, that needs to be on-premise, maybe you've got a hardware team and they need to be in the office because they've got their hardware in the loop simulators or something like that, uh, and they're joining calls, they might be tempted to go into that video conferencing room, sit around the table, but what happens experience-wise is the audio is always bad because half the team is usually far away from the mic, and the team is laughing about inside jokes, something they shared at lunch or something like that. And then the people who are truly remote are sort of uh, unintentionally excluded from what becomes the, the company culture. So a best practice, um, if you're gonna do hybrid, um, is to um, treat your calls, even if they're sort of hybrid, as all remote. So ask those people who happen to be co-located to remote in from their own computers um, with their own headsets and their own audio, and then you'll create that level playing field and not unintentionally uh, exclude anybody. Yeah, that's a that's a huge, I think, um, and very current misconception uh, about remote is uh, that hybrid can be in transition easily. There are a lot of things that we need to consider, and we're sort of learning those as we go. A lot of subtleties about this operation. Uh, anything else that leaders should be aware of that um, leaders may not know or that they should test out? Yeah, I would say um, being a, a metrics driven organization is really important. Um, I, th I think it becomes important for every company when you get to a certain size, particularly in terms of headcount. Um, I wouldn't advise that, you know, a, a 40 person company with a 10 person engineering team invests a lot of time in their productivity metrics because, you know, you can rely on the stand up and these other things to make sure that uh, everybody's aligned and doing the right thing. But when you scale up into the, you know, hundreds, let alone thousands of people range, uh, if you're not um, using metrics to, to manage to at least some extent, you're going to miss trends. Um, and so um, when that inflection point is triggered, um, if you're remote, it becomes that much more important to keep people in line. Or maybe the other way to think of it is that uh, if there's an inflection point for you, it moves up. Whoops, move, almost tipped over my water there. Uh, it would be, uh, it would happen earlier uh, in that uh, time frame um, uh, because you're, uh, you're all remote. And so uh, metrics, again, they allow you to um, uh, confirm your instincts. They'll also tell you things that you, uh, you are missing wherever you have, uh, have blind spots. Um, and when people are distributed and they're working most of the day independently, not in the same room with one another, if they can look at a chart, uh, they can understand what they need to do, uh, particularly when they encounter an ambiguous situation. You know, I'm, I'm confronted with some AB decision uh, that we didn't anticipate. What do I do here, whether I'm designing a process or writing some code? If they understand the metric that you're optimizing for, they'll usually make the right A-B decision um, and get through that uh, ambiguous situation. Yeah, very well said. Excellent insight. Excellent in insights throughout. Uh, I really appreciate your time uh, sharing this knowledge with all of GitLab and also with our learners at Coursera. Uh, so thank you very much and it's been great to have you. Thanks for having me. Hi. Managing a remote team isn't too different from managing in a co-located office. But where does it differ? It can require a big adjustment and some rethinking of processes, tools, and even people. This week, you learned how crucial strong communication practices can be for a global team. You learned why and how to build your internal documentation. 
We talked about how to measure what's really important and how to keep work flowing asynchronously. And finally, you learned how to lead and evaluate future leaders without the need to meet face-to-face. -face. Please join in the discussion in the forums and help yourself to the additional resources we have linked below. Next week, we will look at the stages an organization goes through while transitioning to remote work. See you all there. Like most people, I started my career in a traditional office environment. Transitioning to working remotely was an adjustment not only to my personal working style, but also to my expectations. One of the most surprising things I had to learn was that people are still learning how to do remote well. Even though GitLab has been a remote company since the beginning, we are still iterating and developing best practices. Remote work is relatively new. It doesn't have the benefit of centuries of trial and error that co-located businesses can draw from. As an example, early in GitLab's history, our investors were very worried because there weren't any other remote companies operating at scale. Is it possible to scale remotely? It's still a question we get all the time. But of course, we were able to show that it is possible and in fact, we now think it is scales much better than a co-located organization. Still, we didn't know until we tried. Wherever you are now, plan to be in the process of going remote for some time. Not only will you have to implement strong change management, but along the way, you will also have to iterate and adjust your plan based on new information. In 2020, many of the tech giants announced they were going remote. Facebook employs 50,000 people and it gave itself a timeline of five to 10 years for the transition. On the other end of the spectrum, Twitter, with about 5,000 employees, created a remote work option effective immediately and started working on a long-term set of practices to be implemented over months or years. The process of adopting remote practices is going to be very different for every organization, every leadership team, in every company culture. Your plan and your timeline are up to you. In this lesson, we're gonna be looking at pathways and stages you can expect to move through. We're also going to talk about models that don't work so you can avoid some common traps. By this point in the course, you should be ready to start customizing your approach, and that's exactly what we're going to do next. This lesson will comprehensively detail the major types of remote team structures. How will you know what structure is right for you? Start by asking some questions to clarify your expectations. The first thing to understand is how you're implementing remote work into your team structure. Will everyone be remote? or a certain percentage of team members? Is that determined by their job function or their role, or is it more connected to their geographic location? Then, think about what people need on an individual basis. Can they actually do their job without being tied to a physical job site? How are you ensuring people will have access to the things they need to do their jobs and advance in their careers? And how will you make sure they're happy and working well? We've identified at least 10 common types of team structures, but we'll focus on the top five here. In this lesson, we'll give you information on each of them to help you choose a model that works for your organization. Keep in mind that you can transition from one model to another over time. A sustained, healthy, iterative approach to remote is more achievable than attempting to go from zero to mastery overnight. Let's review each of the five major team structures in some more detail. If you'd like to go on a deeper dive, please see the linked resources for even more information. As a baseline, let's look at a fully co-located team. This is an organization that doesn't allow any remote work. 
This may be determined by the industry, by the type of work being performed, by the obstacles and cost preventing remote work, or by simple preference. For example, the nature of some work is that it must be done in person. Or for industries such as banking, the work could be done remotely if not for the risk and cost of updating infrastructure and security that was not designed for remote access to sensitive information. In some cases, leadership may assess the possibility of remote work and decide it's not right for their team. And in other cases, the transition to remote can simply be too challenging to undertake. In early 2020, many workplaces faced an unprecedented challenge in the form of a global pandemic, which caused most people who were able to avoid in-person office work to do so. For no remote companies, this was a much greater challenge than for organizations that were already remote friendly. Excluding remote work also excludes some people, making it more challenging to create an inclusive and diverse workplace. It can also lead to a difficult decision for people who live further from the office or who can't fit a long commute into their day. And for people who do choose to commute, that choice can lead to dissatisfaction. However, there are many benefits to co-located work. The primary benefit is that there's a wealth of experience, tradition, and education you can draw on to run your company. This also translates into shared expectations. New hires usually have a good idea of what to expect in your workplace. It's also easier to communicate, both formally and informally, in an in-person environment. Likewise, it's easier to keep an eye on your team members' attendance and activities. All of this adds up to a stronger culture that's much more easy to build and reinforce. Now let's look at the next team structure. Remote allowed is a very common model throughout the world and across many industries. It's quite simple. The organization maintains office space for all team members, but permits them to work remotely sometimes. Most people spend most of their time in the office with remote work as an exception to the rule. Remote allowed teams typically treat it as a benefit, as a perk, or as a compromise for employees requesting schedule flexibility. Leadership recognizes that the ability to work outside the office can sometimes help people sync their professional and personal needs, raising satisfaction and retention. The main challenges in implementing a remote allowed model are around equity and security. Do all team members have the same flexibility? Does everyone have adequate equipment or workspace to be able to take advantage of the opportunity? Or are people transporting their work computers, which may raise security risks? And then there's the challenge of scheduling meetings to account for everyone's telework days, which are often rotating. However, many employers successfully overcome these challenges and receive the benefits of a happier workforce, fewer working hours lost to errands, and a recruiting perk to attract new team members. In the hybrid remote model, most team members work together in a physical office, while some people are remote some or all of the time. Hybrid remote is quickly becoming one of the most popular team models, particularly for organizations who are transitioning back to the office following global shutdowns. Many organizations were working this way before COVID-19, and many will continue to use hybrid remote models. As we will discuss throughout this course, despite its widespread popularity, hybrid remote is the most challenging structure to execute well. There are many reasons to adopt a hybrid remote structure. For example, you may be expanding your coverage to be available across more hours, more time zones, or more geographical areas. Companies may send an advanced team to a new region or may establish a long-term remote presence for a limited set of tasks. In other models, companies have a core headquarters but support an extended network of resellers, distributors, or salespeople who live in the same areas as their customer bases. And increasingly, employers offer this as a benefit to certain employees who negotiate for the opportunity to choose their location. Overall, this is the team structure with the most challenges to overcome. The greatest challenges center around providing an equitable experience for remote and co-located team members. Remote team members may struggle to access information they need, as well as career and personal development opportunities. They may feel disconnected and underappreciated if they sense they're being left out of experiences that happen in the office. 
and they may not have managers that understand and support the needs of remote professionals. Meanwhile, in-office team members may feel inferior in different ways. They may see others being allowed to work remotely and wonder why it isn't an option for them. They may wonder why it's their responsibility to lobby for the ability to work remotely. And if they do gain remote work privileges, they may worry about needing to demonstrate that they're still just as productive or risk being made an example of. For more on the challenges of a hybrid remote structure, please see the linked resources. All that said, many organizations will still attempt a hybrid remote structure. That's because it looks great on paper. The potential benefits include the significant cost savings from not needing to open satellite offices or relocate team members. And for companies based in areas with a high cost of living, there are also savings from paying comparable salaries balanced for less costly areas. It's certainly beneficial to many organizations to have team members distributed across time zones and regions. And if hybrid remote is done well, it can raise employee happiness. That covers the three types of team structures that work office first. In the next video, we'll look at team structures where the office is minimized or doesn't exist at all. In the previous video, we looked at three team structures, no remote, remote allowed, and hybrid remote. Now let's look at a team structure that prioritizes remote work. Remote first teams optimize their company for remote. They create documentation, policies, and workflows that function on the assumption that 100% of the organization is remote, even if some continue to occasionally visit a company owned office. Teams that choose to be remote first typically have leadership that believe in and support remote work. These teams typically work in a field that doesn't require any work to be done in person. By making remote the default, they gain a significant recruiting benefit and generally higher employee morale. However, they may prefer to have some in-person meetings for leadership, board members, or even specific teams within the organization. Remote first is relatively new and it can have all of the same challenges as working all remotely. That includes the communication and management challenges we've mentioned previously, which affect all remote teams. It also includes the risk of remote employees feeling lonely, left out or burned out. Other challenges might include a feeling of being left out for team members who are not able or invited to join in-person meetings. Or you may find that some team members rely too much on the office without adopting a fully remote first mindset. The benefits of this structure are also similar to those of an all remote team. Happier employees, higher performance, and the ability to hire the best people around the world. And while there is a cost associated with maintaining at least one office space, that may be somewhat offset by the savings from paying locally adjusted salary rates. Now we've reached the final team structure, all remote. Since the all remote team type is the basis for this course, I won't go into great detail here. As you probably guessed, an all remote team has no offices, no set working hours, and a globally distributed team. These companies are traditionally in the tech or knowledge industries, but we are seeing companies from other industries test the waters of remote operations. For this model to function, all of the organization's work must be able to be done remotely. Leadership understands and supports remote work, including its benefits and its unique requirements. This model comes with a significant recruiting benefit, allowing you to hire the best people in almost any location. And if you hire globally, your company can operate 24 hours per day and often seven days per week. We've also described the challenges of all remote previously in this course. To recap, this structure comes with significant challenges in communication and management, requiring focus, strong policies, and training. It can also be more challenging to create a shared culture, which affects employee satisfaction. Employees are more susceptible to loneliness and burnout, and because a truly global team will operate best asynchronously, there are slowdowns throughout communication and work cycles. 
Typically, an all-remote company understands those challenges and puts strategies in place to counteract them. The benefits of this structure make it all worthwhile. Much higher employee satisfaction and performance, increased hiring opportunities, and the ability to create a globally diverse team chosen from the very best candidates. And there are significant cost savings from not needing to maintain any office space and from paying locally adjusted rates. Every organization will have a structure that works best for its needs. By this point, you may have realized that your organization has already adopted some remote work practices, and you may have identified a potential next step for how you may be able to strengthen your remote work offering. If you'd like to continue learning more, please see our linked resources where you'll find additional detail, including more subtypes and variations on these structures. I hope this information inspires you to choose the model that will best enable your team. In 2019, there was a lot of talk about remote work as the wave of the future. When the COVID-19 pandemic hit in 2020, that all changed. Suddenly, it was very present and very current. However, we need to be clear that crisis-induced working from home is not at all the same as intentional remote work. In that global tragedy, companies did not have time to create a remote strategy. Employees didn't necessarily have a good place to work or even the right equipment. And with anxiety high for everyone, it was challenging even in the best situations. When we talk about remote adaptation, we're speaking about the process of implementing one of the team structures discussed in the previous lesson. You could be founding a remote first startup or transitioning an enterprise organization to all remote or any number of other possibilities. What the process really requires is intentionality in designing and adopting a new mindset new practices, and even people and roles that will carry you into a sustainable remote work future. The advantage to transitioning slowly is that you can implement gradual change management, especially for people or systems that require significant transformation. However, this can create fatigue and inefficiency from continual iteration. We've identified five major phases of adaptation, and in this lesson, we'll review each of them. Not all organizations will go through all phases, but you may experience several of them as you execute your remote plan. Now let's look in detail at each of the phases of remote adaptation. As we do, think about what your remote transition might look like. Again, it's common to go through more than one of these phases, though you might not go through all of them. For more information, please help yourself to the linked resources. Skeuomorph is a term that roughly means imitating the features of something else. In this phase, organizations may be operating remotely, but they are imitating many or most of the characteristics of in-office work. The best example we have of this is the sudden shift to remote work that many organizations experienced during the global shutdowns of the coronavirus pandemic in 2020. Companies did not have time or resources to develop remote strategies. Their immediate goal was to continue operating as well as possible, just remotely. In this phase, most people will try to recreate common scenarios as carbon copies, just in a different environment. So a typical hallway conversation will become a one-on-one -on -one direct message, or a pre-planned meeting at the office will be replaced by a video call with the same participants and pre-existing meeting hygiene. There's also a high amount of employee monitoring, since managers tend to be concerned that they're not able to check what team members are doing during their remote work hours. Because this transition often happens in response to a major change or upheaval, team members may not have the equipment and the tools they need to perform their job as well as they did in the office space. The challenges of this way of working should be easy to understand. Remote work and in-office work aren't the same and they can't be done the same way. 
Teams in this phase will quickly run into inefficient workflows, unequal access, and difficulty remaining productive, as well as high friction as expectations encounter the remote reality. Working in this way is not recommended even temporarily. If you have recent experience with this, as many of us do, please share your story in the discussion forum. If we think about benefits of this phase of adaptation, the primary one is that it allows a team to continue operating during a crisis, and that can be very important indeed. And as we saw during the 2020 crisis, there was a secondary benefit as more teams became comfortable with remote working and open to trying it in the future. Many organizations will skip the skeuomorph phase or move quickly out of it and into the functional phase, which is characterized by making functional changes to facilitate efficient remote work. In this phase, teams start to leverage technology such as shared documents, project management tools, even automation to make work more efficient and remote friendly. An excellent example of this can be seen in schools and universities, many of which have been steadily adopting online learning tools and systems both before and after the COVID-19 crisis. This allows teachers and students to improve their experience, facilitating better online learning. The primary characteristic in this phase is at the level of leadership. When leaders begin to ask, what if we didn't do things the way we've always done them? This opens up a new range of possibilities. For an organization to enter the functional phase, it must also be truly functional in the sense that employees must have the equipment and the tools they need to do their work, usually provided or reimbursed by the employer. It's also typical for organizations in this phase to have an increased push toward documentation, recording meetings, taking notes, and sharing documents. Internal communication strategy will also take shape with preferred channels of communication, such as a directive to use shared Slack channels instead of email or private messages. Challenges are still quite common in the functional phase. For one thing, the new policies may be applied inconsistently as organizations in this phase may not have fully developed guidance on best practices or people teams may be undersupported to ensure compliance. It's also common for there to be friction among leadership, management, and the people teams who are not fully trained or convinced on remote adaptation. Communication breakdowns and inefficiencies are common. This is the phase where you will see a huge amount of meetings as information may be difficult to find and there isn't a strong practice of asynchronous work. Nonetheless, employee satisfaction and performance will tend to rise as people start to enjoy the benefits of a flexible schedule and a lack of commute, not to mention having the essential tools for everyone to perform their job function adequately. As individual agency increases, your organization will gain momentum toward the advanced phases of remote adaptation. As you've seen, there's a lot to take into account. It can take a long time and a lot of adjustment to reach the functional remote phase. We'll pause here, and in the next video, we'll look at the next more advanced phase of remote adaptation, asynchronous. In the previous video, we went through the first two phases of remote adaptation. Now let's look at the third, asynchronous remote. An organization that has a significant amount of remote experience or a strong remote model can begin to work asynchronously. Maximally efficient remote environments do as little work as possible synchronously. Most work is done independently and team members only come together for calls and meetings when it's truly needed or else for informal conversations. In the asynchronous phase, an organization will start to see increased global hiring and a wider coverage of time zones and regions. Flexible schedules become the norm as team members are no longer depending on a quick response in order to get their work done. To make all of this possible, documentation will evolve into a centralized single source of truth system that is easily accessed and kept up to date. You'll also begin to see teams enforcing use of systems and tools that benefit everyone so the entire organization can share information as efficiently as possible. 
Asynchronous work does create some growing pains. The nature of this type of work is that it's slower. Both communication and work cycles take longer and that can create friction. It can also be challenging for team members to change their habits and expectations and to adopt new ways of working that can feel risky. As your team expands to include more cultures and backgrounds, there can also be challenges for your people team to serve everyone's needs. In this phase, you'll see your people team expand and take on a larger role. Finally, because there aren't many opportunities to connect in real time, it can be more of a challenge to create an authentic culture and to facilitate informal communication. The benefits of true asynchronous work are many. The greatest benefit is your team members' feeling of freedom, freedom to work when and where they want with adequate time to live their lives. This has huge benefits to employee morale. Overall, efficiency does increase when your team truly begins to work asynchronously, and hopefully your newly global team will welcome in highly talented new members with a diversity of backgrounds and experiences. An organization that is intentionally remote is exactly that, operating with the intention to facilitate remote first operations. In this phase, every facet of the company is designed to work best remotely. Organizations in this phase will have legal entities and documentation in place to facilitate hiring in a large number of countries. All employees will be provided with the equipment, tools, workspace considerations, and other necessities at the start of their employment. Strong security practices are in place, and organization-wide, there's a streamlined implementation of a single project management system, a preferred communication tool, a single document management system, and so forth. On the cultural side, organizations in this phase will have strong value statements which are continually reinforced through communication practices, social interactions, feedback cycles, and other experiences that are carefully thought out for how they will improve team members' engagement in the company culture. Finally, at this phase of adaptation, your organization should be free from any lingering real estate assets, no office required. This is a highly advanced phase of remote adaptation, which means that in order for it to work, leadership must have complete buy-in. If that doesn't exist, or if some leaders are working toward intentionality and others have doubts, friction can result. Intentionality requires massive time and focus to ideate, create, implement, and enforce new systems. Entire teams may be devoted to operational remote strategy. During this process, it can also be common to see employee turnover as people who prefer traditional work environments seek other opportunities. And because remote work is so new, it's not likely that you'll plan for every challenge that arises. Expect the unexpected. Intentionality also comes with many benefits. First and foremost, organizations in this phase will have a high level of order and efficiency as team members and management are well equipped and informed with support to do their jobs. Employee satisfaction in this phase is extremely high. We've commonly observed organizations in this phase reporting 90% satisfaction or above. Employees have the benefits of flexibility as well as support and job security. Operating costs in this phase remain relatively low without the cost of real estate and with well-developed global hiring practices. And as an organization with high satisfaction and great global hiring, your recruiting and retention will also rise. Intentionality is the key to scale in remote work. Once you have achieved this phase, you will be prepared for high growth and longevity. There's one more phase of remote adaptation beyond intentionality, and that's remote maturity. In the next session, we will discuss maturity, and you'll begin to assess your organization's current state and to develop your transition plan. First, please explore the linked resources for more detail on each of these stages. Even a global enterprise with full organizational maturity can still have a lot to learn about working remotely. 
In fact, in order to move through each of these phases, you'll have to develop a new facet of maturity that's specific to remote work understanding. This is an excellent time to take an assessment of where you're at currently. Use the discussion forums and start asking some questions within your organization until you can confidently answer these questions. How mature is your management and are they willing to be transparent with their team on how they're iterating on the fly as they move between phases? Are managers naturally willing to adopt a mindset of trust and empowerment as opposed to command and control? Is leadership open to transparent communication and documentation practices, or do they prefer closed doors and limiting access? Does leadership seek to listen to newly remote team members to understand what voids exist and need to be addressed? Does your company have strong documentation for core processes? Do your team members have a strong understanding of digital communication tools? Do they have secure methods of accessing sensitive information, such as a VPN? Does your business operations or IT department have strong protocols for enabling remote team members? The best advice I can give you here is to be fully honest. Have a low level of shame and try to answer these questions fully. You don't want to move too quickly and find yourself in a vulnerable spot. Depending on how you answer these questions, you may choose to start in an earlier phase or to move more gradually through phases than you originally had planned. It's good to move slowly. Don't jump beyond your organization's comfort zone. Congratulations! By assessing your organization's remote maturity, you've already completed the first step toward creating a remote transition plan. As you've recently seen, going remote is a multi-step process with many elements to take into consideration. The goal of this course is to prepare you for that process. From this point forward in the course, you'll be working toward a final goal of creating a transition plan outline, which you'll be able to use in a real life situation. Step one was assessing your organization's maturity level, and now let's look at the following transition steps that should be included in your plan. For an organization to effectively go remote, adoption needs to begin at the top. Leadership needs to understand and agree with reasons for remote adaptation and to sign off on the transition plan. During this process, it's possible that leadership will lean toward a hybrid remote solution. As we've covered in this course, hybrid remote models can be much more difficult to execute and maintain. Steer away from that outcome if you can, and instead advise executives on the various types of remote teams and how to move through them toward a remote first or all remote model. Leadership should be clear on what practices and processes will change and how. It may be helpful to hire a remote transition consultant or a head of remote to advise and guide this process. Once leadership is in agreement, waste no time. Have the executive team begin working remotely. This sends the clearest signal that the transition is underway and has executive sponsorship. Begin building your remote infrastructure immediately, as it can take some time to transition everyone to a streamlined system of tools, practices, and services. As we've mentioned before, a good way to begin this process is to ask yourself what would happen if every team member chose to work from home tomorrow? Where would communication break down? What types of access to information would people need? What would be the security risks? Would everyone on the team be equally well equipped to do their job? Consider the tools you're already using that you can continue to use as a fully remote team and then assess new tools that will empower you to operate remotely. For inspiration, see the linked resources for information on GitLab's tool stack. Using this course as a guide, start making decisions about processes and best practices to carry you through your remote transition. Your remote infrastructure should also include plans for how you'll address some of the challenges of remote work. Plan for how you'll create opportunities for people to connect in person on a regular basis, such as company retreats or team gatherings. 
Understand how you will support your team members in professional development by subsidizing education and skill building at conferences, by taking courses, through formal mentoring, and so on. Then, develop a structure for informal communications with guidance for casual coffee chats, social calls, networking opportunities, chat channels, and so forth. You can even begin implementing these tactics right away to lay the groundwork for relationships that will continue to grow in a remote environment. Documenting your culture means developing a robust handbook and a plan to maintain it. Your handbook will contain all the best practices and processes you created in the previous step, as well as codes of conduct, company values, and other cultural information. This is a major process, and it's key to rolling out a successful transition. Give this step the time it requires, which can be several weeks or even months. Include a plan for how you'll reinforce the handbook as a single source of truth. That said, there are some things that can't fit into a handbook. Consider whether you'll need, for example, a secure system for allowing individuals to access information according to their access level. Your creative teams may need specific tools for documenting and collaborating on work in progress. And if you have a large library of digital assets, you may need a strong cloud-based asset management system. Calendaring and scheduling may also need to be reconsidered for remote teams. This step is when the remote transition really begins to pick up speed because step five is when you'll start actively empowering team members to work remotely. Start that process by building enthusiasm and reassuring your team. There may be resistance to a remote transition for many reasons. Clear and proactive internal communication is essential to combating fear of the unknown and creating excitement about the increased autonomy. We recommend hosting Q&A sessions to better understand your team members' concerns and perspectives. At the same time, prepare team members with the knowledge and support they'll need in their remote roles. Consider creating a guide to remote work or encourage team members to take GitLab's free certification on remote work readiness, which is linked in the resources. As part of this step, you'll also be issuing and reimbursing equipment for anyone who needs it, which may be everyone. Don't cut corners in this process. It's an important investment and can be very meaningful to your team. Consider hiring workspace consultants to help you in this process. If the goal is for 100% of your team to have comfortable and ergonomic workspaces, what should you consider? For many organizations, providing laptops is a necessary step. Most organizations will choose to reimburse employee expenses on desks, chairs, and other equipment. Many teams will also reimburse co-working memberships, which can be especially beneficial in a remote transition for employees who thrive in an office environment. Now we've just covered steps one through six in a seven step process. To get to this point in your remote transition, it may take your organization several months or even years. If you keep moving forward, learning and applying your learnings as you go, you will eventually determine that your team is ready for the final step in the process, closing the office. We'll discuss that very important step next. For more on planning your remote transition, please see the linked resources. Imagine your office closing its doors forever. Can you envision that future? It's a symbolic moment for organizations that have historically been tied to a physical location. And for most teams, it represents the end of a long transitional period and the beginning of a new work reality. There are two main approaches to this. On one hand, you can close the office early during the remote transition instead of at the end. This indicates to your team that you're serious and ambitious about a remote transition. If you do this, make sure your team is adequately prepared with the necessities so that they can do their work, which might include replacing some office space with a co-working space or another temporary solution. Alternatively, you could start encouraging remote work during the transition. So by the time you shut your office doors, it was already effectively empty. 
If you do this, make sure you use active reinforcement so you don't have stragglers or uneven adoption of remote practices. Use the office closing as a team building experience. You might bring the team together for a ceremony or a celebration, either remotely or at the office building. Or maybe offer everyone a bonus for a successful transition paid for with the savings on your overhead. However you decide to do it, once your office is closed, it's closed for good. Divest from your real estate holdings entirely. Don't leave yourself a safety net because you won't need it. Closing the office is a major milestone, and that event may be far in your future. At this point, you should have an early idea of what the journey ahead will look like for your team. This week, we started by looking at your expected timeline. Then we reviewed the various steps in between where you may be now and where you want to be in the future. Along the way, your plans may have changed as you learn new information. How does your timeline look now? Please join in the discussion in the forums and help yourself to the additional resources we have linked below. Next week, we will talk about how to build a flourishing company culture. See you all there. If you work in an office, there are probably some things you take for granted. Birthday parties, casual Fridays, free swag, or even just bagels and muffins at an in-person meeting. Well, in remote work, all of that is gone. As a result, you have to create an intentional strategy for how to help your team connect with your company culture. For the purposes of this module, let's create a baseline definition of culture to build on. The Harvard Business Review introduces it in this way. Strategy and culture are among the primary levers at top leaders disposal in their never ending quest to maintain organizational viability and effectiveness. Strategy is a formal logical system for reaching your organization's goals. Culture is a system of values and beliefs which guides people to act in certain ways through establishing norms and shared assumptions. Or as Peter Drucker once said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. A strong company culture supports your strategy and goals. A weak or dysfunctional culture can undermine your strategy and your team. A company culture is hardwired into the people. They recognize it intuitively and respond to it in predictable ways. However, culture can be created intentionally or unintentionally. As an example of an intentional culture, our GitLab value statement and supporting actions help people to know what is expected of any given interaction, and it also empowers people to reinforce those values through behaviors. However, we are also subject to unintentional cultures such as systematic and cultural biases that employees have learned throughout their lives. This culture is echoed in their behaviors at work, resulting in challenges, creating a diverse workforce. In a co-located organization, culture is built and reinforced both formally and organically, and it mostly happens through in-person interactions. As we've mentioned before, distributed teams have fewer opportunities to connect in the ways that we're used to. This can result in teams becoming siloed, people becoming disconnected, and culture struggling to flow organically through a remote team. That's the most obvious difference that you should prepare for as you move into remote work, but there are other factors to take into account as well. A geographically distributed team may also have different culture backgrounds, norms, and expectations about the professional environment. For example, if your team has several people living in Latin America, a few people in Spain, and a few people in the United States, what language do you speak at work? When a team is in multiple time zones, how do you schedule meetings? How is information communicated and with how much context? Burnout and overwork are more common in a remote environment. 
co-located organizational cultures may function well with a high emphasis on drive and performance, but a distributed team needs more documentation and policy in place to empower each team member to achieve work-life harmony. Because of all this, it's even more important to have a culture focus when building a remote team. And keep in mind that a strong culture will ideally be linked to and support your business strategy. In other words, the type of culture you choose to build and the way you implement it will also likely need some adjustment. For example, GitLab's culture of transparency and iteration enables asynchronous work because people can access the information they need no matter what hours they are working. That's a strategic choice. It helps create a holistic environment where team members know how to work and are empowered to be effective. Whether or not you have a formally documented culture already, it's a good idea to strategize for how you'll create a culture that supports remote work while maintaining your company's unique character. This is where values come in. In the next section, we'll discuss values and you'll begin learning how to select and implement a value system that supports your organizational culture. In Basecamp's handbook, which we've linked in the resources, it's written that there's as much to unlearn as there is to learn when it comes to living out values in a remote role. It requires company-wide trust that team members have permission to drop prior organizational baggage and truly operate differently, which may feel like a trap for those who have been exposed to traditional bureaucratic norms. Psychological safety is critical, and leadership should place a high degree of importance on ensuring that this does not erode. At GitLab, we believe that one of the company's biggest risks would be losing the values that bind us. In the next lessons, you'll learn more about how values work, how to create and implement them, and how to choose the ones that are right for your team. At GitLab, we've spent a lot of time coming up with our company values and even more time iterating on them and helping to reinforce them. In the next lesson, we'll talk about how we put these into action, but first, here's what we try to live by. Helping others is a priority, even when it's not immediately related to the goals that you are trying to achieve. Similarly, you can rely on others for help and advice. In fact, you're expected to do so. Anyone can chime in on any subject, including people who don't work at GitLab. We do what we promise to each other, to customers, to users, to investors. We care about what you achieve, the code you shipped, the user you made happy, and the team member you helped. We give people agency to focus on what they think is most beneficial. We care about working on the right things, not doing more than needed, and not duplicating work. This enables us to achieve more progress, which makes our work more fulfilling. Diversity, inclusion, and belonging are fundamental to the success of GitLab. We aim to make a significant impact in our efforts to foster an environment where everyone can thrive. We do the smallest thing possible and get it out as quickly as possible. Don't write a large plan, just write the first step. Trust that you'll know better how to proceed after something is released. You're doing it right if you are slightly embarrassed by the minimal feature set shipped in the first iteration. Be open about as many things as possible. By making information public, we can reduce the threshold to contribution and make collaboration easier. Everything at GitLab is public by default. Being direct is about being transparent with each other. We try to be both straightforward and kind. 
There's a lot more information about what goes into these values as well as a collection of sub-values that act as substantiators. If you want to know more, please explore our handbook. And remember, as part of our value of transparency, we welcome you to use any of these values to support your own culture building process. Let's look at a hypothetical startup and how they could go about creating their values. This story represents a common process we see a lot of organizations go through, but it isn't specific to any one company. After this case study, you'll have a chance to discuss your thoughts in the forum. This startup was founded by two friends. They didn't create any value statement at first, but they had a strong culture because the founders were personally connected with every new employee. Within five years, the startup was doing really well and experiencing global hypergrowth, but the culture seemed to be struggling to scale and personnel issues were becoming a pervasive problem. So the founders sat down to create a value statement. Their goal was to create values that would uphold the culture of high performance they had from the beginning. They disagreed about what their company values should be, but they were able to come to a compromise without needing input from their team. The founders shared their list of company values with the communications and branding teams who helped them to write statements supporting what each value meant. Then the people team was asked to sign off and develop a plan to implement these values. At the next all hands meeting, the new value statement was shared with the entire company, which now had several hundred employees in many different countries. There were a lot of questions, but there wasn't enough discussion time to get into detail. The founders asked people to send in their feedback in writing. A few teams did send some feedback, mostly the engineering and community teams, but their feedback was mostly contradicting each other. The founders made a few changes to the statement's values, but decided to stick with their gut and keep things mostly as they were originally. A year later, Employee turnover was up and satisfaction was low. A common complaint in exit interviews was an unhealthy culture, and several people mentioned the value statement. The founders were surprised because they hadn't heard that feedback. They wanted the values to bring people together, not make them unhappy. This is a fairly common experience. These hypothetical leaders made some mistakes along the way, but their intentions were good. They wanted to enhance and strengthen their company culture. Please use the discussion forum to share some things that might have helped make this process more effective or less effective. In the lessons ahead, we'll talk about why this is so challenging and how to do it a little bit better. Even if you're a small team or a solo founder, there are resources available to help you build a value statement. But if you have a larger team at your disposal, use them. The greatest resource for determining your values are the people who make up your organization. Take this time to survey your team on your culture and your values. Find out what's working and where you can improve, especially as you move into a distributed asynchronous environment. Once you've collected information from your team, work with your leadership, your board, and your people team to start selecting values. Start at the top of the organizational chart. The people leading your company should be where this discussion begins and where it ends. They have initial input and they have the final decision-making power on values. But while leadership has the best view of the horizon, they don't always see the view from the ground up. HR professionals should be able to advise on how values will be perceived and how they might be turned into behaviors. Because your values should support your business strategy, also include your advisory board, both as resources for inspiration and as reviewers. The board can also offer an external perspective of how your values will read in your industry. It's not uncommon for organizations to have a leadership retreat to align on the values and behaviors that will become the business's norms going forward. 
This can be a good opportunity to connect and to share a positive vision of your remote team's future. Apply design thinking techniques that empower attendees to innovate and come up with creative ways to develop values. But also feel free to borrow liberally from other organizations' values. GitLab's values are open source, as are many of the other companies we've mentioned. Don't try to get everyone to agree on the ideal values. This will be an iterative process. Consensus can be too rigid. Instead, understand that the values you're creating will be the starting point and that they will evolve as you implement them. Identify proactive and reactive tactics your leadership will use to roll out the new values. Proactively, you'll want to communicate your expectations, introduce changes carefully, and implement training and reinforcement plans. But you should also plan to react to feedback. If you're creating an open and supportive environment, your team should give you honest feedback on how your values are working for them. This in itself is a powerful way to build culture. And if you react by collecting feedback in good faith and acting on it, you'll strengthen both your values and your team cohesion. Your HR or people team should be given time to prepare some programs and events offer both synchronous and asynchronous experiences so people are empowered to ask questions and to do further learning on their own time. AMA or Q&A sessions are a good opportunity for leadership to transparently explain the vision they want to achieve and these events can go a long way toward building support. For people who want to understand more about how values work, also offer additional training and resources. Finally, consider connecting feedback to values. Encourage people to offer both positive and negative feedback in terms of the organizational values that are most relevant. For example, at GitLab, someone might be praised for supporting the values of collaboration and results by working cross-functionally to complete an important project. Of course, you should document everything thoroughly from the vision behind the values to how team members can support them. And of course, you should always be willing to iterate on that documentation as feedback comes in. What happens when a mature organization comes to a point where one of your company values is no longer serving your team as well as it could? Well, I can tell you what we did here at GitLab in 2020 and what we did with the process to evolve and iterate. Our job as leaders is to create an environment where everyone can do the best work of their careers, regardless of their race, their gender identity, their age, religion, ethnicity, ability, sexual orientation, and the list goes on. In the spring of 2019, we sent out a company-wide diversity and inclusion survey the responses show that we were doing a good job of inclusion, but the diversity of representation in our staff wasn't where we wanted it to be. Making people feel that they belong without changing anything about themselves? This also matched with some of the chatter we overheard in conversations and Slack channels. As the diversity, inclusion, and belonging manager, I met with our CEO to discuss what change could look like and why it would be a positive change. My recommendation was to update the value of diversity and inclusion and to add in belonging. The idea of not belonging wasn't necessarily on leadership's radar because due to the, their roles, they don't always have an opportunity to hear about what it's like to not fit in. But when they saw the raw data, they could clearly see the need and the value of improving employee happiness and retention. We discussed it in depth and in the end, we decided to make the change. We created a communication plan and encourage the team to share their thoughts openly. Some good discussions about what belonging meant came out of that, and it helped people to have a new lens that they could use to evaluate projects and initiatives. The values you envision at the beginning of the process may change as you work to put them in place, or may need to be updated later. You won't always know until you know how to find out what is resonating with your team. But in the remote environment, it's difficult to overhear the chatter. There is no water cooler, and it's easier for people to have private conversations. So don't trust that you'll just find out if people are unhappy. 
Be proactive about collecting feedback, both quantitative and qualitative. It's most important that the values are right for the time and that the team they serve. Don't get stuck with a value that is no longer resonating. Allow your company culture to evolve. When you're not in the same physical space, creating a shared culture strengthens bonds. It helps people connect and ultimately helps your organization be stronger, happier, and more effective. This week, we shared GitLab's values and the values of several other remote organizations. We talked about why this process is so important to distributed teams and how to approach creating and updating your values. Please join in the discussion in the forums and help yourself to the additional resources we have linked below. Thank you so much for joining us here today.